All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan. Welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium Marine Science Center. Canada is an Arctic nation, yet only a small percentage of Canadians actually live there. How do people living in the southern parts of Canada, or anywhere else for that matter, learn about the unique and fascinating marine animals that inhabit this enigmatic environment? Let me present to you the online Arctic Marine Life course. The course is supported by the Science in Canada's North Café Scientifique series. We would like to acknowledge the support of the W. Garfield Weston Foundation and the Canadian Association of Science Centers. Our partners include the Alliance of Natural History Museums of Canada, Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums, Telespark in Calgary, the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, and the Discovery Centre in Halifax. You can keep track of the dates and locations of all the presentations on our website at www vanacqua.org Arctic Marine Life Course. If you miss a presentation, you can always watch it online after it's been recorded. And if you have any questions about the course, you can contact me, Jonathan Holtquist, jonathan.holtquist at vanacqua.org. Our speaker is Danny Kent, head curator for BC and Arctic Waters at the Vancouver Aquarium Marine Science Center. He is an avid marine photographer and has captured amazing images of countless marine creatures over the course of hundreds of dives in Arctic waters. His presentation tonight will introduce us to the many invertebrates and fishes that call the Arctic home. Danny Kent. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight and thanks for those of you that are joining us online. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Arctic marine fish and invertebrates tonight. It's a big subject. We're going to go through a really rapid journey through a lot of critters, so uh, uh, stay with me here. Uh, but before I start, I'd like to just uh, go over my uh, background a little bit. Um, I've worked at the aquarium for about 28 years, and for the last 17 year years, I've been fortunate enough to go to the Arctic about a dozen times. Um, most of my work up there has been all diving. Uh, in Resolute Bay in the North Central Arctic and in Cambridge Bay in the South Central Arctic. And uh, the divings included collecting animals both for the aquarium and for other institutions around the world. It's uh, working with a few researchers up there, but really the bulk of it's been taking pictures of all the critters that I've seen in those areas. So that's really what I want to share with you tonight is what I've seen and hopefully it represents um, what you might see around the entire Arctic, but by no means is it, is it, is it I'm going to claim it's thorough enough to do that. So the Canadian Arctic itself is quite large. It's bounded on the west side by the Pacific Ocean. It's bounded on the east side by the Atlantic Ocean. And you know it shares a lot of species with both those two oceans. So there's some overlap. There's some that range across the whole Arctic and down both sides. Um, if you're familiar with things from the Pacific coast, you'll recognize a few things. And I'll try and describe a few things that are similar or, or species that, that range into both areas as, as we go along here. But before I start going any further right into the animals, I should say that I did a lot of diving on the, the coast of the Pacific before ever going to the Arctic. And, and when I was offered the first experience to go up there, I didn't really have any preconceptions. I wasn't sure what to expect. I, I kind of thought it would be bleak and barren like it is above the water. But I was quite surprised. It's quite beautiful below the water. There's a lot of richness, a lot of diversity, a lot of uh, beautiful animals, and a lot of similar things that I, I, I was you know, comfortable seeing because it looked a lot like what I'd seen in the Pacific Northwest. But there's also a lot of uh, differences that I found up there as well. Um, one of the things that I thought worth mentioning here is that uh, for a big part of the year, the surface of the ocean is frozen solid. So there's all that sea ice there. And, and before the, the pl plankton blooms occur in, in, the, uh, in the phytoplankton in the open ocean, before the sea ice breaks up, the algae is growing on the underside of the ice. So there's a rich algal community a food web that's just occurring on the underside of the ice. This piece of pack ice there that you can see has some diatoms growing on it. And there's over 200 species of diatom alone that just associate with the ice. And that forms food for a lot of other um, invertebrates on the underside of the ice. There's amphipods, bacteria, all sorts of things. That things like this Arctic cod that you see on the right here underneath this pack ice, that they feed on that stuff and they're in turn ate, eaten by larger mammals in some of the other food chains. So the Arctic cod are really the link between the sea ice community and some of the other food chains. And that's quite different compared to what we see in the south. Another thing that's worth mentioning is, you know, having grown up on the coast here, we have a really beautiful intertidal zone. We have really strong intertidal zonation. You can see bands of, of mussels, barnacles, seaweeds, a lot of fish and invertebrates that just associate with the intertidal zone. We don't really have that in the Arctic for the most part. 
in the winter, in late, late fall and early winter, when the, when the ocean freezes up, it freezes up against the shore. Um, and then when it breaks up in the late spring and early summer, those big giant chunks of, of ice that start moving and grinding, and it's a very dynamic environment, and they're scouring and grinding up the bottom. So we really don't get well-established zonation and, and, and not as really as rich of an intertidal zone, and that's quite different from what, what I was used to. Another thing that has to do with the sea ice is when the sea ice freezes up against the shore, it freezes in large rocks, stones, and boulders on the underside of the ice. And then in the, in the late spring and early summer when the ice breaks up, those big chunks of ice float out, out to sea. And as the ice begins to break up and melt, those stones are released from the underside of the ice and they drop down onto the bottom. And, and often you can have soft, muddy, featureless bottoms that have these giant stones that are called drop stones. And this drop stone that you see here is all colonized by soft corals. They become nice little oases of really rich species diversity for all sorts of neat things to colonize on. So drop stones is something that, that, that is, I was not also used to. And because the water is so cold here, a lot of the animals, the seawater can get down to almost minus 1.8, which is where seawater freezes. This summer, when we were diving up there, the, our temperature data loggers that we were wearing were, uh, were recording temperatures of minus 1.4. And so a lot of these animals are, you know, they could potentially freeze, but a lot of them produce biological antifreeze agents, these glycoproteins in their body that prevent ice crystals from forming. Even some of the diatoms um, do that. So let's move on to our first group that we're going to burn through here, um, the sponges, the peripherans. There's about uh, 160 species of sponges in the Arctic. Um, to compare that to the Pacific Northwest, there's about 260 uh, on our coast. Now, I find them difficult to identify even on our coast, so I'm just going to stop and leave it at that and move on from the, from the sponges. The next group are the cnidarians. Uh, the first of those are the sea anemones. So these are something that, you know, they really stand out when you're diving. They're the sort of large benthic megafauna that you'd see in the Arctic, big, bright, colorful sea anemones on rocks and on boulders. Um, a lot of them are very similar species, or even some of them are the same species that we have on our coast. This one up here is an Urticina species, Urticina equis, similar to our painted anemones that we have on our coast. This is a Cribronopsis species, similar to our crimson anemone that we have on our coast. This one's quite different, however, we don't have this around here. This is Horm Hormathia nodosa, and it has this large column with these large bumps on it, and that one's rather unique to the Arctic. This is one of the ones that lives on a soft bottom. It's uh, Allantactis parasitica has these very fine tentacles and this one um, has a symbiotic relationship with snails. It only lives, so far from what we've seen anyway, it only lives on the backs of snails and it somehow rides around on them. I'm not sure if it's a commensal relationship or, or if it's parasitica. The species name would indicate that it's parasitic but I know there's been some debate over that. Uh, not, anemones not only so associate with hard bottom areas but also with soft bottom areas. This this guy up here in the top left corner is Halcampa arctica. It's a burrowing anemone, lives on soft, muddy bottoms. And it's funny because I'll just take an aside here for a second. The, the, the Latin name is Halcampa arctica. And you know, as we started to learn these species with me and my colleagues going up to the Arctic, um, we started realizing that you know, some things were very difficult to, to figure out what they were. We still don't know a lot of them. But uh, Almost all of them have a, a, a species name that's either Arctica, Borealis, Por Polaris, or Glacialis. So when in doubt, we just throw in one of those names and you know, it's, it becomes an Arctic thing. You'll hear some more names like that as I go on. Um, this here are, are, the, are a type of, uh, another type of burrowing anemone, a tube-dwelling anemone, a Pachycerianthus, Pachycerianthus borealis. Um, and they typically live on also soft, muddy areas, although this one's on a rocky ledge that's all laden with silt. And they have these very fine tentacles that capture um, plankton from the, from the water and to feed on. And they're also food for some of the larger nudibranchs that we'll talk about in a minute. The next group of cnidarians are the soft corals. So far we've seen about four or five species of soft coral in the Arctic. This one up here and this one here are the Jersemia rubiformis, the red soft coral, although there are white varieties in the Arctic, which we don't see down here. Um, Jersemia occurs on our coast. Usually we see it on really rock hard bottoms in high tidal current passages. In the Arctic, we, it's surprising to us, we see it on soft muddy bottoms. It still has to atta attach to small rocks or clam shells and stuff, but, but you can see it on, on, on a place that just doesn't make sense if you're used to diving on the, on the BC coast. 
Um, and we this one, uh, we've sent genetic samples off to various researchers, and they're they're trying to debate whether it's, it's it is the same species we see down here. But for now, that's what we call it. And if you look up here, there's a little red amphipod on this one, which I'll talk about later when we get to the amphipods. Uh, this soft coral here is an Alcyonium species. Uh, it's not necessarily new to science, but it's new to us. We found that in Cambridge Bay this summer, diving at about 100 feet, and we'd never seen it there before, and it's, it's quite spectacular. We have some on display right now. Uh, the next group of cnidarians are the Hydromedusae, so a very small jellyfish for the most part, very prominent in the plankton, in the spring and summer plankton blooms. These guys, like a lot of plankton in the Arctic, tend to come in in waves. You know, one day it's going to be thousands of one species, and then the next day the tide pulls them out, the next day it's thousands of a different species. Very colorful, very neat in, in shape and morphology. Um, and um, this one here is one of the neater ones. It's called Tychogastria polaris, the folded stomach jelly. And they like to sit on the bottom. In this case, he's sitting on a piece of kelp. But they like to sit on the bottom and raise their tentacles up into the air and then collect food that way. But we're not really sure what that food is, so we've been having a, a rough time trying to keep them here at the aquarium because it's you, they don't seem to eat the stuff that we're providing. Uh, the Scyphozoans is the next group, so the true jelly, some of the bigger jellyfish. It's actually relatively few of them in the Arctic. These are the only two species that I've had the opportunity to see. Uh, the one on the left is uh, a species of lion's mane jelly. Our local species is Cyanea capillata. Uh, this may be that, but we're not sure. Again, we've taken uh, tissue samples, send them to a researcher at UBC. She's trying to determine if, if they are the same species or not. We also have been able to reproduce that one in the lab here, so our, our biologists are looking at the early life stages of this jellyfish right now and seeing if that can tell us something about whether it is the same species or not. Right now they're seeing you know, the ephyra stage and the polyp stage. The, the young jellyfish look different from when we, we produce our local lion's mane, so that's sort of interesting. Uh, this is the northern sea nettle. Uh, Chrysora melanaster. It's very similar to our Pacific sea nettles that we have here. They get quite large. I've only ever seen two of them, but they have these beautiful dark stripes on them. The next group of cnidarian are the Staromedusae, the stock jellies. So this is sort of the first example of a few that I'll talk about where um, we have stock jellies on our coast. They're more like this kind here, where there's a few different species, but they're quite tiny. They're usually in the intertidal zone, maybe just a little bit subtidal, but they're small. They're maybe a centimeter, centimeter and a half long, and that's about the size of this guy here, but this species here get quite large in the Arctic. Like a lot of things seem to have this gigantism in the Arctic, and we're not really sure why, but this one's not even fully hydrated in my colleague's hand, but it, when, it, when puffed up with water, will get much larger than its hand. And they're basically like a jellyfish that's turned upside down, stuck on, on the ground, and then tentacles up in the air collecting, uh, collecting food. They also sort of skip that whole polyp and, and strobilation stage. They just have a larvae that migrates off and then turns into a, a, a miniature adult. The next group are similar to the cnidarians, but they don't have the stinging cells. It's the comb jelly, so they have bands of, of cilia that run down their body that help move them through the water. You can see all of them have it here on, in some fashion. Um, the big guy on the right here, right above me, is Bolinopsis infundibulum, the lobed uh, comb jelly. They also occur on our coast, and they even on our coast they get quite large, maybe 10 to 15 centimeters long. But in the Arctic, they can get about the size of a football and they're quite spectacular. And it's neat because these bands of cilia refract the light, so you get this sort of rainbow, rainbow appearance as the, as the cilia ripple up and down. Uh, this is a Baroe cucumis. It's a predatory comb jelly that eats other comb jellies. Um, this is Mertensia ovum. It's, a, it's more like our sea gooseberry, but kind of flattened, more, a little more um, oval shaped. And then this one was, uh, was newly collected to, uh, for us anyway this summer down at about 100 feet on the same site where we found the soft corals. This is Baroea bisicola. It's, it, it's found in other oceans of the world, but typically really deep sea. And we've saw it you know, relatively shallow in the Arctic. And they get quite large. That one was probably 15 to 20 centimeters long. And the photo doesn't do it justice, but they have a very deep, deep red color in the middle of them. 
actually one quick note here. I have 10 species down. So about, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, they only knew five species in the Arctic, but then they did this big worldwide census of marine life and at least five more were discovered. So, um, so that was kind of interesting. Okay, so lots of worms in the Arctic. Um, again, here's a good example, oops, of, go back. A good example of gigantism. There's small leeches in the Arctic that infest onto, onto fish, but this is one that we found that's probably about 15 centimeters long and about as thick as your little finger. It's quite large. They're really kind of creepy and almost snake-like. Uh, lots of lug worms in the soft, muddy sediments like this guy here. Uh, spaghetti worms, type of uh, polychaete that live more on hard bottom and, uh, and on kelp bed areas. Lots of varieties of uh, feather duster um, tube worms collecting particles from the water. Scale worms that live on hard bottom. This is interesting. I, when I first found these guys, I thought it was a, something called a, a tusk shell, a scaphopod. But it turns out it's a polychaete worm. Um, a pectinarid or a cone shell, um, and it's a little polychaete that lives and secretes this little sand grain house and lives on muddy, soft bottoms. I think Peter had one in his slideshow. Um, this here is a really neat worm called an amblyocyllid worm, and I never even knew what they were until I'd seen one in uh, Andy Lamb's uh, Marine Life of the Pacific Northwest book, and he'd found them in glass sponges uh, in our waters. And this guy just showed up one day in one of our exhibits in one of the Arctic tanks. He must have come in hidden on some rocks that we collected, and so we photographed him on the glass. Uh, then there's a bunch of oddball worms. There's the peanut worm in the upper left corner there. There's the penis worm, the preapulids up in the right corner there. There's about five species, who would have thought, of penis worm in the Arctic, 12 species of peanut worm in the Arctic. This is uh, one representative of the ribbon worms, nemertines. They get quite large in some cases. They can live on soft bottoms. They can live on hard bottoms. And this is a flatworm. I think there's over 130 species of free-living free -living flatworm in the Arctic, and they usually are found on harder bottoms and under, on the underside of rocks like this one is. Um, mollusks, so just to give you a comparison, there's about 1,600 species of mollusks on our coast and about, uh, about a third of that in the Arctic, about 480 species, of which there are about 140 species of bivalve. So bivalves being the clams, mussels, and scallops. This is a little paper-thin scallop that we dredged up at about 200 or 300 feet down. There's some uh, mussels, various clams. Um, again, more clams, the, the uh, Maya truncata, the Greenland cockle. Um, clams are a lot of food for some of the big things like walruses. They're food for certain species of snail. I'm sure some of the fishes eat them. Typically, you don't see, the only thing you see if, of clams when you're diving up there are the siphons protruding from the mud. One of the exceptions to that is this guy over here, the Arctic nestler clam, Hyatella arctica. Um, and they can sit out on rock ledges, sitting on rock, uh, uh, hanging onto rock walls on the bottom, just laying out. They don't, you don't often see them buried. Or they can burrow into stone. So this is a cross section of a rock that we did where you can see them, um, they've burrowed in like a pittock into the rock. And that's what you might see if you were to swim over the rocks, just their, their siphons protruding through holes in the rock. And they can occur in huge densities in the Arctic as well. And we move on to another group of mollusks, the gastropods or the snails. There's a, it's really well represented, over 300 species. They can be herbivorous. They can be detritivores or, or scavengers. And they can also be predators, like this guy here is a bucinum snail species. Get, they get quite large. And they're one of the guys that likes to eat those, those clams if they can catch them. And this one here has just laid uh, some eggs. And there's an older egg case or a bunch of egg cases right behind it there. Lots of bucinums in the Arctic. And more gastropods. Not a lot of limpet species from what I've seen. Again, at, at, well, this might, I'm just speculating, but it may have something to do with the, the sort of lack of intertidal zone. Limpets tend to like harder bottom areas. They're grazers for the most part. And you know, locally here, you see them mostly in the intertidal zone, but not, not a lot in the Arctic. There's also some of these weirder sort of snail-like guys. This is a lamellarid. Uh, it's almost like a cross between a snail and a nudibranch. They have a thin paper shin, thin shell underneath this fleshy covering on the back of them. 
And this is a velutinid or a velvet snail, almost like a cross between a snail and a half a clamshell or you know, with, the, with a snail's body underneath it. These occur locally here in our waters, but you almost never see them and they're a little more prominent in the Arctic. So we move on to the nudibranchs or the sea slugs. The top two um, pictures up here are uh, types of aeolid nudibranchs, so the kind with the, the pretty little serrata on their backs. Um, quite a few of those in the Arctic. There's, this is also um, one that would occur on our coast. This is Dendronotus frontis. It gets quite large, maybe uh, 15, to, uh, 15 plus centimeters long. And, and they're one of the guys that feed on some of those cnidarians, some of those burrowing anemones that we, we saw earlier. And then this is an Adelaria, or a, like it's one of the few Dorid, or the other sort of style of, of nudibranch that, that it, not really well represented in the Arctic and not, not very large, not very many of them. And we move on now to the planktonic uh, snail-like guys, the pteropods. There's three species in the Arctic. These are the two most common ones the, and the two, only two that I've seen. Um, this is the sea angel, Cleone limacina. And this is its food, Limacina helicina. It's like a snail with little winged feet on it that flaps around in the water column. And these are a good example of one of those things that comes in by the literally tens of thousands or millions in, in a plankton bloom and then will disappear the next day. You won't see them. And these guys eat almost exclusively, these guys. They, there's been a few accounts of them eating something else, but that's pretty much it. Now, these both live on our coast as well. But the sea angel on our coast would be, you know, be lucky if you saw one that was maybe a, a centimeter and a half, two centimeters long. In the Arctic, they get to about eight to 10 centimeters long and they have really beautiful red and orange coloration compared to ours. And they get this name, the sea angel, because of their sort of teardrop shape with these little flappy wings that they have on either side. But they're not so angelic when they go to feed on these guys. This part up here is their mouth. And what happens is there's a big protruding mouth parts come flying out with hooks on them and they grab onto these little snail guys and suck the life out of them. So um, they're, they're kind of creepy when you see them feed, otherwise they're very angelic. Uh, not a lot of species of chitin in the Arctic. It may also be one of those things that has to do with sort of not a very rich or, or um, established intertidal um, ecosystem. There's at least eight species of cephalopod. I've only had the opportunity of seeing this one species. This is a, a species of uh, stubby squid or bobtail squid uh, from the genus Rossia. And there, we have a similar one on our coast here, Rossia, uh, that lives down in muddy habitats. Same thing with, with, as these guys here. Uh, I, I've asked a few of the Inuit guys that we've worked with up there if they ever see any octopus or squid, and the only way they've seen them is actually in the stomachs of bearded seals, the, the beaks. That's the only way they've ever seen any of these cephalopods, is, and that's the only way I ask them too if they've even eaten clams, because it, it's not very easy for them to collect clams, um, but the only way they've often had clams is getting them from the bellies of a walrus and eating them after that. Uh, we move on to the sea spiders or the pycnogonids. Now, they're not actually related to spiders at all, although they have an uncanny resemblance. Um, now, we have sea spiders on our coast. I think there's 39 sea spiders in the Arctic. We have about 50 on our coast, so they're fairly well represented in the Arctic. Um, the big difference is it's hard to find one on our coast, and they're very tiny. They're usually associated with some other invertebrate, usually their food, living on either a sponge or a soft coral or something. They're much more prominent in the Arctic. In this shot here, you can see some skeleton shrimp hanging out on these hydroids. And you can see at least four large sea spiders kind of hanging out down here. Now, they're super skinny legs. They, their stomachs actually extend into each of their legs. And I've heard them described as, uh, instead of a, a body with legs, they're more like legs with what with, happens to have a little bit of a body. Um, they don't have a real respiratory system. They just respire through diffusion because they're so skinny. Um, and yeah, they can get quite a few centimeters across. In fact, they're another good example of gigantism. This is one that a colleague of mine caught just north of Resolute Bay. It's about dinner plate size. And I've seen ones like this before in the Antarctic and from photos and from the deep sea. But uh, these guys like that live up in the Canadian Arctic. And that's one, it's about the size of a small tarantula and it looks sort of similar to one. That's one that we have here on display and that is quite common in the Arctic. We move on to another group of, uh, in the arthropods, the decapods, crabs and shrimp. Um, 
having dove in Resolute for quite a few years before moving to Cambridge Bay, we'd never seen a single crab in, in, in Resolute. So I was convinced there was no crabs in the Arctic until we moved to, to Cambridge Bay and found these guys. This is the, uh, the Arctic Lyre crab, L-Y-R-E, and, and it's uh, highest coarctatus. They're very common up there. Um, when they can catch them, the locals will eat them, but I'm sure they're food for a lot of, of the marine mammals up there. This is uh, Lebius polaris, the polar shrimp. And um, they're very common everywhere that I've dove in, in, in the Arctic so far, and they get quite large. Um, and they're probably a really good food f for a lot of the fish that live in the Arctic. Um, not much has been known about their early life history, and we were fortunate enough last year to reproduce them and grow them up here in the lab, so that was pretty cool. Um, this is a species of bladed shrimp. Uh, another species of bladed shrimp. And then these two guys here, this is Lebius grunlandicus. It's some brooding some eggs in the back, back here you can see. Uh, they occur on our coast, as well as this here, the tank shrimp, Sclerocrangon borealis. Um, they get quite large, they live in soft, muddy bottoms, and they also range down to here. And just recently, we've had one in the back that's been brooding eggs. So when these guys' eggs hatch, they release larvae up into the water column that are free-floating planktonic larvae that will eventually grow up, metamorphose, settle down, and become a benthic bottom-dwelling shrimp. But these guys here, from what we've seen just recently, actually, just in the last week, is they tend to, they seem to be brooding their eggs and their, their babies hatch out. They're, they're not miniature adults, but they don't seem to have a planktonic larval stage. And we've seen that with a few um, other species of uh, Arctic invertebrates where they seem to skip that planktonic stage for some reason. All right, we we'll move on to the isopods. So there's over 100 species. This is one of the most sort of um, the coolest ones in my, my mind. And they're, it's one of the larger ones that we've seen. They can get maybe just over 10 centimeters long. This is uh, Siduria. It used to be called Mesidotia, but it's Siduria. And there's three species of Siduria. They you often associate with estuaries and on really soft, muddy bottoms, like this guy's on here. And one of the diagnostic characteristics for identifying the species that we have is that it doesn't actually have eyes. So that might tell you something about where these guys live. I think they've spent most of their time buried in the mud. And here's a nice uh, photograph showing you a nice clean one, which probably spends a lot of its time buried, and then one that maybe spends more time up on the surface because it's all fouled up with hydroids and algae. And then this guy here, to me, says, you know, I, I really wasn't, a lot of things were similar when I started diving in the Arctic, but it wasn't until I saw one of these that I really knew it was, I wasn't in Kansas anymore, is basically, this is the Arctic isopod Arcturus baffini, one of the coolest animals that I've seen up there. They're, they're almost like a praying mantis shape, the walking legs down here. The eye is right about here somewhere. And then they've got these big, long antennae. They're just like nothing we have on our coast. And they, they have these really neat modified appendages around their mouth that they use for feeding. And they've got these very fine hairs on them. And they open it just like a barnacle and it forms like a basket. And they sit there into the current and they hang on pieces of kelp and on hydroids. And they open this basket up and collect food that way. So that, you know, just their shape alone and that feeding is pretty cool. But the really neat thing about them is how they reproduce. So they brood their eggs back here underneath the legs. And then when the babies hatch, they migrate up onto the antenna. And you can see this. This is a shot from one in our displays here. There's two big long antenna with hundreds of little babies all hanging onto them. And here's a close up of the babies. They're just like miniature little adults, each with these little feeding mouths and everything, hanging on the mom there and feeding just like, like she would too. And they grow up quite large on the antenna before they take off or get kicked off. And you can see here's one that's really these guys have grown up huge. In fact, that mom's probably weighted down by them because they're, they're so large. So we move on to the next group of arthropods with the copepods. So lots of different species. The, there's two main groups, the, cop, the calanoid copepods, like the two in the top pictures there. Those are the, the pelagic ones that, that uh, they're free float for the most part in the water column. And then the harpacticoids, which that's not a harpacticoid. On the, that's actually a parasitic one on, a, on the back of a cod. But harpacticoids are the ones that maybe associate more with the underside of the ice or down in the substrate in the mud. And there's more, more species of those. But cal, uh, you know, the calanoid ones are one of the really important ones in the food web. They're packed full of nutrients, packed full of oils. They, you know, the importance of copepods can't be understated in, in terms of a food source for a lot of the, the, the larger animals. Uh, a bunch of oddball arthropods, so barnacles, 
maybe again because of that lack of intertidal zone, but not a lot of species that I've seen. This is the only one, in fact. Uh, this is a cumation species, a bottom-dwelling benthic mud-living thing. We have cumations on our coast, very tiny, less than a centimeter usually. This guy's about two centimeters long. This is a, a possum shrimp or a mycid. Uh, again, we have them on our coast. Occur, you know, like almost like krill, look krill looking, uh, and, or like a little pelagic shrimp. They come in big schools, food for a lot of the small fishes near the bottom. And then this weird guy kind of puzzled us. We got this guy in a trawl a couple of years ago in Cambridge Bay, down at a few hundred feet down. And it turns out that it's an isopod, and it's an isopod that either lives close to the bottom or up in the water column just off the bottom. It's called a munopsid. And they have these big long arms and they actually like kind of dance or walk through the water column. And so it's munopsis is that guy. Uh, move on to the amphipod. So something um, that Arctic Arcturus, the isopod, that really made me uh, feel like I was in the Arctic. The other big difference that uh, you know was quite shocking was the number, amount, the size of amphipods. Amphipods are really big in the Arctic, both in size and diversity and number. There's two main kinds of uh, amphipods. There's the Hyperiod amphipods, like these guys here, big googly eyes often associated with uh, living on other invertebrates like this lion's mane jelly, they're piggyback riding or they burrow into them and they sort of parasitize them. There's even some free swimming ones, which is unusual and kind of unique to the Arctic, like this, the Misto uh, Hyperiod amphipod. Um, and then there are the Gamerid amphipods. These are the kinds that normally live on the bottom, although there's, again, in the Arctic, there's some free swimming ones, so that's kind of odd. Um, they can be plant eaters, they can be uh, detritivores or, or scavengers, like this Onissimus species, or they can, and they can also be quite large. This guy here is Stegocephalus inflatus, and they can, this guy can get about the size of a toonie, and they brood their young inside as well. Uh, more gamerid amphipods, again, just to give you an idea of the different colors and stripes and different shapes and morphologies living on different things. This one's living on a, on a basket star species. And now another weird group of, of amphipods, the, a more specialized group called the caprellids or the skeleton shrimp. Again, we have them on our coast. We have them right in our exhibits here. You can see them there about half a centimeter, if you're lucky, to a centimeter long in the Arctic, over five to eight centimeters long. These ones are neat, they have these big red spikes on their backs. They also have a brood pouch where they carry their young, and this is one in one of our displays here with all the babies that have hatched and are hanging out with, with mom. And then the next group of gamerid amphipods are those that specialize in that algal ice community. There's at least seven species that hang out there. They, whoops, they, um, they live on the underside of the ice in some of the channels and the air bubbles. Um, they're feeding on that algae and then these guys are in turn fed on by things like the Arctic cod. Uh, so they're quite important. And then this one I thought was worth mentioning on its own. It's called the hedgehog amphipod. It's Paramphothoe hystrix. And originally we found them, they're quite spectacular. They're not super huge compared to some of the other ones, but they have these brilliant spikes on the back and a nice deep red color. And they would live only on red soft coral. That's the only place we ever found them. And then eventually we started finding these red and white striped ones also living on the soft coral, and that was pretty cool. And then we came across this sort of pale yellowish one that we only ever found these guys living on the northern sun star, Solaster and Deca. And this is a close-up of one on the back of a Solaster. I think other people have found them only living on sponges and other people have done genetics work on them and they're trying to determine if it's four or five different species or if it's all the same species and they've just picked different things to live on. We move on now to the echinoderms. And uh, there's about 300 species of echinoderm on our coast here and about 150 uh, up in the Arctic. So pretty well represented. Um, not a lot of species of basket star and feather star, but these are two groups that are more deep sea usually. It's deeper, well, deep, really deep in most parts of the world, but uh, even deep a little bit for the Arctic. And they both use their appendages to filter food out of the, out of the water. We move on just to the regular sea stars. These are one of those, just like the sea anemones, these are one of the bigger uh, benthic animals that you'd see down there that stand out. Uh, a lot of species like the rose star here are ones that occur on our coast. They occur all across the Arctic and down onto the Atlantic coast. They get larger in the Arctic, however. 
This is Solaster and Deca, the one that had those little amphipods living on it. They can be yellowish or purple like this. They also occur on our coast. Um, there are species of Arctic blood star and then some more unique ones that, that are only found in the Arctic. And again, more sea stars. These three are more Arctic related, whereas these two are ones that range down onto our coast. This is the wrinkled slime star, Terraster militaris. They can be five-armed or six-armed. There's also eight-armed uh, variety or different species that are eight-armed. And then we move on to the brittle stars, 29 species and can be quite large, but also really uh, in high density. So in soft, muddy bottom areas, you can get hundreds per square meter. Move on to the sea urchins. There's 11 species, but I've only ever seen this one here. This is the green sea urchin, same species that we have on our coast, same species that ranges down the Atlantic coast. Most people think of it only as a, a herbivore grazing on kelp, but they can scavenge quite, quite a bit, which I imagine they would have to do in the Arctic with it being dark for half the, half the year. And this is Cucumeria frondosus, the brown sea cucumber. They get quite large. This is the scarlet sea cucumber, the scarlet armored sea cucumber, Solus uh, fabricii. And then we move on to the tunicates. So this, the bottom dwelling tunicates like these guys are very similar to some of the species we have here. In fact, this is almost identical to the sea peach that we have here. Um, but there's also these pelagic or, uh, tunicates or larvations. And th this last summer when we were diving in Cambridge Bay, there was literally millions of these in the water. You know, they're probably, I don't know, three, three centimeters in diameter. The animal is actually just this little tadpole-shaped guy that lives inside of there, and it secretes this mucus basket around itself that uses to trap food particles and bacteria and things. And then as that gets clogged up, it discards the, the mucus basket, and produces another one, and, and so on. And so there was you know, literally millions of these alive in the water column and literally millions of them discarded um, mucus baskets all on the ground and stuck in anemones, stuck in coral polyps everywhere. So they obviously provide food for a lot of things. And they're also one of the main sources of marine snow in, in the Arctic. Okay, we'll move on to the last group, the fishes. Uh, there's about 240 species of marine or diadromous fish, so fishes that live either exclusively in the ocean or that, that some part of their life cycle is spent in freshwater and then also in, in saltwater. And it's interesting because uh, out of that 240 species, 55% of them just come from a relatively small number of, of groups like the sculpins, pricklebacks, eel pouts, um, and snailfish. Um, our first guy here is not actually in any of those families. It's a Salmonid. It's the Arctic char, Savalinus alpinus. And uh, this is a young one here, and that's an adult male in breeding color. Um, they're a really important food fish for a lot of animals in the Arctic, but also for the Inuit people. They really rely on, on these guys for food. Uh, we've, we've seen them up there. They're, they catch them in the ocean with gill nets. They catch them fishing in the rivers. They catch them in lakes. Um, they're also uh, commercial food fish, and they're an ocean-wise species as well. And we, we actually obtained our original eggs from a hatchery in, in, the, in the Yukon that is uh, ocean-wise certified. So the next group of fishes are the lump suckers. Um, we found three species so far in the Arctic. I believe there's more, but uh, this guy here is the Atlantic spiny lump sucker, very similar to our Pacific spiny lump sucker. Lump suckers are cool because they have these um, fused pelvic fins that form like a suction cup. So they typically live on rocky bottoms or kelp beds or things like that where they can stick down onto the ground. They don't do well in soft bottom areas. These guys are like our Pacific ones, but the, the tubercles or these little spines that they have on them here are quite a bit larger and more prominent on the, on the Atlantic spiny lump sucker. Uh, this is the leather fin lump sucker. Um, they get quite large. A couple of years ago, we collected some that were about the size of an orange, and uh, they're, they're quite spectacular, but we've yet to be able to reproduce them. Um, this guy here, we're not sure what it is. It's a juvenile of some species of lump sucker. These two species, when they hatch, they have these big tubercles on them right from hatching. This guy doesn't have any, so we think it's a different species entirely, and it's probably some smooth, uh, smooth lump sucker species, because there are we we know of some species that are are called smooth smooth lump fish or smooth lump suckers. Uh, the next group are the snailfish. There's about 20 species. So these guys are very tadpole shaped. They also have the fused pelvic fin that forms the suction cup. 
Um, in some parts of the world, they're, they get quite large in the deep sea. The ones in the Arctic, not particularly large, but um, fairly, uh, fairly easy to find on kelp, kelp blades or on rock, sticking to rocks. Uh, the next group, uh, there's a lot of species of sculpins in the Arctic, so uh, at least 36. This is probably the most common and, and one of the largest uh, species. Uh, this is the four horn sculpin. You can see it's Myoxocephalus quadricornis, and you can see these four uh, bumps on fleshy protuberances on the top of its head that it gets its name from. And this is one that's sort of foraging underneath the pack ice. Those are a group of Arctic cod that it's sort of beelining after, because these guys will basically eat anything that goes in front of that mouth. Uh, a lot of other species of sculpin up there. This is a. Um, my, uh, a short horn, I think it's a, no, th yeah, that one's a, a staghorn, sorry, staghorn sculpin and breeding colors from one of our exhibits. Uh, this is a big eye sculpin sitting on a piece of ice. This is a species of icellus sculpin that we've reproduced in the lab here and it's laid eggs in our exhibits and that we've preserved, um, you know, larval series that, for, for documenting. And then we move on to the eel pouts, the zoarcids. So in, in a lot of places in the world, eel pouts are usually only found in the really deep, deep environments. On our coast here, you can see them at sort of scuba diving depths, deeper scuba diving depths, like, you know, often below 80 to 100 feet. In the Arctic, these guys are almost intertidal. They, you can find large ones right up, just, you know, right up near the shore. Um, they also get quite large, maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 60 centimeters long. Um, they are also almost all mouth at the front end, so they eat pretty much anything. They eat other fish, they'll eat cod, they'll eat shrimp, they'll eat probably those clams, worms, anything that goes in front of them. And uh, this is a smaller species here, the fish doctor. This is Gymnellus viridis, and they're a sexually dimorphic species, so the males look different from the females. The, the male has this bright yellowy orange head and this really distinctive eye spot on the dorsal fin. And we've reproduced those here. Both, uh, we've also reproduced these saddled, um, saddled eel pouts too, and they both lay very large eggs, so the size of a salmon egg or even a little bit larger. And at that, uh, large eggs at that cold of water that they live in, so close to zero, uh, the eggs take about eight to 10 months to incubate. And the next group are the pricklebacks and gunnels. So this is the only gunnel or folded species that I know of in the Arctic. It's the banded gunnel, Pholus fasciata, and that's a male in breeding color from Cambridge Bay. And this is the four-line snake blenny. This is the Arctic shanty. And this is one of two or three species of snake prickleback that live in the Arctic. Now these two guys here, we have them in the back and we've got some gravid females right now and we're trying to reproduce those. And, and hopefully we succeed and we can learn something about their, their early life history. And the shark. So there's a number of species of sharks and rays in the Arctic. There's even a species of long-nosed ratfish. Apparently eight species of shark uh, technically occur there. O only the Greenland shark is sort of a more permanent resident. And I have to say this, this is unfortunately a dead one. It's the only one I've ever seen. Uh, someone shot it a few days before I arrived in Resolute, and this is all I got to see, but it was about a, uh, about a nine-foot specimen. Uh, Greenland sharks are really neat. They're in the, the uh, sleeper shark family. They're, the Latin name is Somniosis microcephalus. And uh, so they're very slow moving, they're scavengers. It's one thought that they maybe actually follow the, the movements of the narwhals. And so as the narwhals, some of them die or the calves die, these guys scavenge on the, on the dead bodies. Um, they're also very toxic. So they're the, the most toxic shark in the world. And so they're not normally eaten, although in Iceland, they're apparently considered a delicacy but you gotta rot the flesh for about 20 weeks before the chemicals that make them toxic break down enough that they can be eaten, although I've heard it's quite disgusting. Um, and last but not least are the cod. So there's 13 species of cod in the Arctic. Um, two are sort of more permanent residents. This is the Arctic cod, Boreo gaddis seda, and this is the polar cod, Arcto gaddis glacialis. Um, the, another species that we've seen up there, I didn't put a photo up, is the Greenland cod, Gaddis ogak. And uh, Gaddis ogak get quite large. Um, uh, Arctic cod get, that's about it for maximum size. But they're, they're, their importance in the food chain can't be understated either. They are, occur by the billions, literally, in the Arctic. And they're like one of the, the main food for uh, Arctic char, for seals, for narwhals, for belugas. 
And uh, they're also that link between uh, a lot of the plankton communities, the ice algae community. And we've been fortunate enough to reproduce them here at the aquarium. They're very expensive for us to go up and collect diving and bring back here. So in the last few years, we were able to um, artificially spawn them in the lab and grow them up. And so now we have quite a few hundred of them to, for studying. <coughs> and I think that's it. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Danny. Uh, that, that was great. So we, we actually picked up a, an online question uh, about five minutes into your talk. So uh, just wanted to run this one by you. I think we can do a couple questions and then we need to go to our next uh, presentation. So uh, this is from Ross on YouTube. Is it true that all kinds of clam species and coral are dying from acid in the water? And if yes, how are we going to help? So I'm, I'm thinking that he's talking about ocean acidification and how that might be affecting the species up there. So do you want to, do you have any comments to say, to share with Ross on that? Uh, yeah, I, honestly, I'm not an expert on anything like that. I probably don't know much more about this than Ross does. I know that, uh, you know, the, the shells of clams and the skeletons of corals are made up of calcium for, for the most part. And, uh, and Calcium doesn't do very well in an acidic environment, and as the the you know the pH drops in the ocean, I imagine that the formation of their their uh, shells and and coral skeletons is not going to be as you know as as easily to do, or it's going to break down. So, but I, I really am not not an expert on that. Um, you you mentioned that when you go diving up there, that you're up there with some scientists. Are there anybody? Is there anybody up there that's looking at ocean acidification and its impact on some of the shelled animals? Uh, not not the people that I am. There's some colleagues from UBC that are interested in doing that. One of the a PhD candidate that was working with us on Arctic cod, uh, studying the Arctic cod and physiology of Arctic cod. She's also interested in doing work on ocean acidification, and uh, um, but uh, she hasn't got funding for that yet. Okay, Ross. So um, maybe uh, maybe you could do a Kickstarter and we get some money going so we can study some ocean acidification up in the Arctic. Well, you can touch base with us. So do we want to take some other questions here in, in the audience here in the theater? Uh, if you could, why don't you just go ahead. Oh, yeah, we've got a, a mic coming up right there. And then just repeat the question when yeah. you. Yeah, thanks. Um, what makes green sharks toxic? Or the green land sharks toxic? Uh, it's a chemical called TMAO, I believe. It's trimethylamine or something like that. I'm not, sh I'm not sure. I'm not a biochemist. Um, but I know it, it, it can produce a drunken feeling to those that eat it, but it can easily kill you as well. And I guess the rotting process breaks that down and makes it less toxic somehow. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if it's actually meant to do that. I don't think so. I think, you know, if sharks have lots of weird chemicals in their body. They're really high in urea, so they smell a lot like urine. The flesh smells like urine. In fact, there's some Inuit you know, legends about them, where they came from. Apparently, the, the, the Greenland shark came from uh, the old woman that was washing her hair in urine, and the, the cloth that she was drying her hair with blew off into the ocean, and that became the Greenland shark. And then the, the Inuit also have a legend about Sedna. That's their sort of um, mermaid or, you know, ocean goddess or whatever, and that Greenland sharks live in the piss pot of Sedna because they smell like urine. I know that maybe hasn't have anything to do with TMAO, but... It's the best I got. So they actually produce the toxicity. It's not something they're picking up in their food. No, it's that... my understanding. It's just part of their part of their natural chemistry for whatever it's used for. But uh, yeah, they're not. It's not something that they get from their environment, as far as I know. All right. Was there one more question? Let's do one more question. Go ahead, and then Dan, if you could repeat the question too before you answer it. Okay, so the question was the clam that buries into the rock, how are they doing it? Is it chemical or is it physical? I, I actually don't know, but I know that there's um, local species of clam called pittics that have like a little teeth, almost like a drill bit on the backside of their shell and that they actually wiggle back and forth and drill just like a, the end of a, of a drill bit that you know geologists use to get into the ground. I'm guessing they must do something like that, although I've never actually seen it on the, on the hyatellas. Uh, I don't believe it's chemical, that, how they do it. 
All right, great. So I think, uh, Sarah, that'd be a great, great one to follow up on. And uh, maybe you can uh, let us know if you dig some uh, other information up on that one. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. Appreciate you coming in here today uh, and uh, talking with us about uh, the fishes and invertebrates. And, and I have to apologize to Danny because I, I asked him to talk about probably the biggest group of organisms that you could possibly talk about, and I gave him the least amount of time because, you know, we have someone who's going to talk about narwhals or had talked about narwhals for 30 minutes, and he's had 30 minutes to talk about hundreds of different species. So thank you very much for taking on that challenge, Danny. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and uh, uh, remind everybody that the Vancouver Aquarium Marine Science Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to conservation of aquatic life. And if you'd like to support the aquarium, uh, you can check out our website at www.vanacqua.org. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you again soon for the next class.